We now turn to respiratory viruses. And we're going to begin with one of the most successful pathogens of humans, and that is the rhinovirus. Rhinoviruses are one of the viruses that cause colds, and they cause about 1 billion colds a year. That, and everyone's familiar with having a cold. It is an infection of the nose, and, rhino, and I say, as I said, rhinoviruses are the most frequent cause of the common cold. So let's dive into the virus. First of all, it has a protein capsid, and you can see that in this drawing right here. And again, it's a 20-sided structure, and you can see that it forms a sphere and a protective sphere around the nucleic acid. The nucleic acid is a positive strand, single-stranded RNA virus. You can see the layout here. The first four proteins form the capsid. Then you have a protease, that degrades this protein. So what happens is it makes a polyprotein and the messenger RNA, the single-stranded RNA genome is translated into one big protein and then the protease do, chops it up into the various proteins. So there's the protease, there's the capsid, and then there is the polymerase. So it's a very small virus and it's very straightforward and simple. So let's look at its re replication cycle. The majority of rhinoviruses find their host by attaching to the ICAM receptor and entering the endosome. The drop in pH of the endosome causes uncoating of the virus and movement of the single-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm. The intact positive single-stranded RNA looks enough like a messenger RNA to fool the ribosome into translating it into the polyprotein precursor. The polyprotein precursor is then digested releasing the replicase and all the other proteins. As an RNA virus, rhinovirus cannot use normal host machinery for its replication, so the virus has to code for its own replicase. The proteins that perform viral RNA replication are transported to the surface of the membrane vesicles where the process takes place. Interestingly, replication begins with a vinyl priming protein, VPG, that is covalently attached to the end of the RNA genome. Replication proteins copy the positive single-stranded RNA to make a negative single-stranded RNA strand. The negative strand is then replicated to form further positive strands. Some of these lose their attached VPG and migrate back to the ribosome to serve as templates for translation. After several rounds of application, positive single-stranded RNA that still retains its VPG assemble with other structural proteins to form progeny virus. Progeny virus is then released by lysis of the cell. That's pretty much the replication cycle and as you can see it's pretty straightforward and simple. So transmission and symptoms. Transmission is airborne, in other words people coughing it into the air and then it landing in other people. Direct contact uh, you touch, you, you know, interact with someone who has a cold and they give it to you, or via fomites. Fomites are surfaces that can harbor the virus alive and then other people get it. This is probably one of the more common ways of picking up a cold, is that you touch a surface that someone who's had a cold touched and the virus is there, and then you touch your eyes or mouth or face, and then the virus gets access. Everybody knows the symptoms of a cold, a sore throat, a runny nose, a cough, sneezing, and congestion. There is very little fever or just a mild fever, which distinguishes it from some of the other respiratory viruses. Colds are basically diagnosed from symptoms. Very few people seek medical attention when they have a cold. And there is no effective treatment for colds. Okay, All the over-the-counter stuff does is mask symptoms. So emergency, mucinex, blah, 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 vitamin C, none of that is going to shorten the duration of your cold. Zycam does a little bit, but honestly, I don't really think it's worth the small effect that it does have. The next virus that we have is influenza virus. This virus is composed of eight negative single-stranded RNAs. Again, as a reminder, these negative strands cannot be translated into protein. 
And each of these segments, if it's copied, makes a positive strand and one mRNA. Uh, six of the eight mRNAs that can be copied from these strands code for single proteins, while the remaining two code for two proteins by differential splicing of the RNA. Each mRNA segment is associated with multiple copies of the nucleocapsid protein. You can see that drawn here, you know, coding it. So all these RNAs are, are protected by a nucleocapsid protein and they have a polymerase attached to them. Remember, negative single-stranded RNAs that form a part of a genome cannot be replicated by the host cell and they have to bring their own replicase. So here's the influenza A genome. And again, just to emphasize this, at the top here, these are all negative RNA segments. So they have to be copied into positive strand messenger RNAs. And then that gets translated and you make all the different parts of the virus and if they're shown here. Okay, how does influenza A pathogenesis and replication work? Again, we're talking about the replication of the virus. So the cell recognizes, or the virus recognizes a cell by the HA on the outer membrane of the virus. It will bind to any one of the numerous sialic acid containing proteins or lipids on the membrane of the cell. The virus is taken up in by receptor-mediated endocytosis. So this is a typical endocytotic pathway, and you see this in step one. A pH drop inside the endosome causes a conformational change in the HA protein, which then fuses with the endosome membrane. And this results of a release of the genome segments into the cell. Okay, so influenza virus has two problems now to overcome if it is to replicate. First, the genomic RNAs of the virus are not messenger RNAs and cannot be translated by the ribosome, as I said before. Each influenza virus must, therefore, first create a complementary messenger RNA strand before protein can be synthesized. The host cell lacks a protein capable of doing this, so the virus needs a replicase activity to be present before expression of its own genome. Influenza solves this by carrying its own replicase with each virion. In fact, each one, each virion nucleic acid has a replicase attached to it. Immediately after entering the nucleus, and again, these uh, virion nucleic acids migrate to the nucleus, the replicase goes to work making copies of the RNAs to create a messenger RNA. Now, it makes sense that DNA virase might replicate in the nucleus so it can borrow host replication machinery, but why would this RNA virus do this? This is in response to a second problem. The copied positive RNA strand needs to look like messenger RNA, and therefore they need five prime caps and polyadenylated tails. These five prime caps are readily available in the nucleus, and the replicase snatches caps from cellular messenger RNAs and attaches them to the positive, newly synthesized positive strands. Polyadenylation is added by the replicase after copying the strand. So now it looks exactly like a messenger RNA and the finished viral positive RNA strand now goes out into the cytoplasm and the ribosome dutifully translates it. After they've all been translated, viral membrane proteins have signals similar to those of the host membrane proteins. For example, HA and NA have the appropriate signals, and after translation, they wind their way through the Golgi apparatus and undergo glycosylation and eventually end up on the host cell membrane. So they go undergo glycosylation, everything they need, and these guys end up HA and NA on the host cell membrane, and then they all migrate to the same area, right? All the other mRNAs are translated in the cytoplasm. Proteins involved in replication of the virus move back in the nucleus and catalyze the synthesis of full-length positive strand mRNAs, then of negative strand viral RNAs. The viral nucleocapsids converge in an area in the cytoplasm adjacent to regions of the membrane where HA, NA, and M2, that's another membrane protein, are accumulating. Assembly of the viral particle is complete 
when the membrane containing HA, NA, and M2 together with the eight viral RNAs then buds from the cell. Okay, so that's the replication cycle. I think the things that are really interesting about it is this cap stealing mechanism. How is influenza diagnosed? First of all, transmission. It's by airborne droplets. Influenza, people will sneeze and cough, bring these droplets into the air. They then find other victims. The influenza virus can be taken up by surfaces, but it doesn't live as long on surfaces as like the rhinovirus does. Influenza will establish a local upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, in rare cases, it may spread to the lower respiratory tract where it's more serious. You get classic flu-like symptoms, fever, malaise, headache, and body aches. You could, you could have a cough, you could have stuffiness. What distinguishes it from a cold is the fever and the intense body aches. Systemic symptoms are caused by interferon and the cytokines released in response to the infection. Antibodies generated are protective to a specific antigenic type of influenza virus, but not to other antigenic types. So as soon as another virus emerges, you're then susceptible again. Okay, influenza diagnosis and treatment. Influenza can be diagnosed by rapid antibody tests looking for the nucleocapsid protein in like uh, secretions from your mouth or nose. Antivirals work if given soon after infection, but they don't generally prevent the feeling bad. They'll just shorten the length of the, the, the flu. Some things that can do this is Xanamivir, Paramivir, and Astelamivir, and they will inhibit the neuraminidase. And the neuraminidase is useful in exiting the cell. Baloxavir marboxyl inhibits the cap snatching activity of the polymerase and prevents that from going through. And you can see uh, here's some structures of the different molecules. These drugs again shorten flu duration by a couple of days. Finally, the last respiratory virus we're going to talk about is, of course, SARS CoV 2. And that is what causes. COVID-19. SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus with a positive single-stranded RNA genome. The membrane is decorated with a number of proteins, with the spike glycoprotein probably being the most important for immunity. The prominent spike proteins, as shown here, give the virus the appearance of a solar corona, hence the name of the virus type. SARS-CoV-2 genome is large, is 30 KB, which is quite large for an RNA virus. And the first two genes, ORF1A and ORF1B, encode the polyproteins of which parts make up the replicase. So these two make the replicase. The next one that you'll see is the spike protein, and then there's other various proteins. And again, I don't expect you to remember all these different things. Right. This is a large replicase that is unique because it has a three prime exonuclease proofreading function that is unusual for an RNA viruses. Normally RNA replicases do not have this proofreading function. So it makes fewer mistakes than like the influenza virus or cold viruses will. It will therefore not evolve as fast as other RNA viruses. The spike E and M proteins on the surface may be targets for the immune system and for vaccines as we've learned. SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis and replication. Again, with viruses, we're talking mostly about the replication. Right. It recognizes the ACE2 receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. These receptors are found in epithelial cells that line the lung, heart, kidney, and brain and gut, thus accounting for the targets of the disease. Once SARS-CoV-2 uh, binds to this receptor, it's taken in. There is a pH drop in the endosome, and that causes cleavage of the S protein and then fusion with the membrane and dumping of the nucleic acid into the cytoplasm. After entry of the single-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm, 
It heads to the ribosome. The viral genome has a five prime cap and a poly A tail. And because of this, the ribosome recognizes it and translates it into a large polyprotein. This polyprotein is then broken up by proteases and one of the proteins released is a replicase. The replicase then copies this positive strand into a negative strand and the negative strand into various messenger RNAs. These are all translated and the proteins go to their respective locations. The replicase will go to where the genomes are being replicated, the spike protein and N, M, and E will head to the envelope. The nucleocapsid protein will then associate with the genome. This associates and then binds the N, M, and E, and they facilitate the reaction with the vesicle that contains the spike protein. This then buds into a exosome or endosome, right? And then this exits the cell. And finally, this exits the cell by exocytosis, so it buds out of the cell. Everyone's familiar with the symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, and the disease course is as follows. Symptoms will appear 2 to 14 days after exposure. An early sign, warning sign is the loss of smell. Up to 67% of people who get uh, COVID will lose the sense of smell. 98% of people have a fever. 76% of people have a cough. Some will have shortness of breath and some will have fatigue and body aches. The majority of cases of COVID-19 are mild. However, as your age increases, your risk of getting serious complications from COVID-19 increases. If you look over at this chart here on the right, you can see the uh, infection versus mortality ratio. And if you look at young people, under age, your age and younger, you see it's very unlikely. It's, you know, 0.01% of people could will die from infection of this virus. But as you climb up in age and you get above 70 or 80 years old, your risk becomes close to 10%. Now, it turns out that it's not your age so much as pre-existing conditions. As you get older, heart disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, high blood pressure, cancer, etc., increase your risk. And that is what's going on here. And the people who have these afflictions are more likely to have problems. If you look at no pre-existing conditions, the risk, even for somebody of, a, of an advanced age, is quite low. It's less than 1%. However, a thing I do want to point out is hospitalization and death is possible at all ages. Okay, the investigations of SARS-CoV-2 treatment continues, and in fact, we've come up with some really good ones. Paxlovid has shown spectacular success, success against SARS-CoV-2. So, pro protease inhibitors such as Paxlovid that prevent the translated protein from being chopped up into its various pieces is very effective. RNA-dependent replicase inhibitors such as remdesivir and nolampavir have also shown some success. So let's look into the details a little, a little bit more of how these work. Uh, ritonavir it is added to Paxlovid and it interferes with enzymes that degrade Nermatrelovir. So Paxlovid is actually two drugs, right? Ritonavir and Nermatrelovir, right? Uh, ritonavir slows down the metabolism of Nermatrelovir and decreases the amount of dosage you have. And here's the two compounds. Ritonavir slows the metabolism of Nermatrelovir and that's why it's added. Nematrovir is the protease inhibitor, and you can see it actually binds the protease as shown here, and it interferes with its activity. Using Paxlovid reduces the risk of hospitalization and death by over 88%. So it's an extremely effective drug. Okay, that is it.
for respiratory viruses.